Welcome to Second Opinion, the reviews show here on the Nexus. Today, Ian R. Buck, Ian Decker, and Ryan Rampersad will be sharing their experiences with Android 7 Nougat. Find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash SO8. All right, so before we actually get into the meat of the review, Android, not Android, Ryan and I. <laughs> I am an Android. <laughs> Sometimes it seems like it. Are going to talk about your new get. Yes, it's a go get your new get. Hey, that's pretty good. He could also be making a cool joke about Microsoft's package manager called NU Get, New Get. Wow, that was a deep cut. Uh, all right, so Ryan and I know a little bit too much about Android. We, we're, we're too deep into that world. So uh, I'm going to start this episode off by asking Ian Decker, what things did you actually notice changing when your Nexus 5X up, updated from Android 6 to Android 7? Well, first the screen turned off, and then it turned back on again. This is a good start. <laughs> Actually, the first thing that I noticed right away was the notifications. Yes, I told you. I told you he was going to notice the notifications. I, I am very impressed. Because before they had been smaller blocks that were had a clear background. Mm-hmm. Um, there was space between them. Yeah. Yeah. And now it's just sort of one flat white, white line. There's a little line between each of them. Um, but it also is better at showing you the little cursor from where they come from and things like that. So like if it's a YouTube video, it shows you the cursor for the, um, for the subscriber, not the subscriber, the channel, the channel is from, Oh yeah. From, um, mm-hmm. Otherwise the, the, the little icon. Um, yeah. Yeah. Kind of thing. Yeah. One thing, I don't know if this was different or not, but whenever I'm on that home screen, sometimes if it's just like, Oh, that's not interesting to me, I'll swipe it away. I'm not sure if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's more difficult to do than oh. it had been before because they get sticky. So like sometimes, so like say, so I have one right now from Postmodern Jukebox right here, right? If I swipe it away or try to swipe it away, it doesn't always go away, even if I swipe it all the way over. Mm, mm-hmm. Right. So if you have that momentum, then it'll swipe away. But if you like stop your finger and then let it go, then it stays on there. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I think the reason that that's changed is because uh, it has that little gear icon that shows up behind it when you swipe it to the side. Yeah. And that gear icon is there to let you change the like notification prior or like priority for that app. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yes, that is something that changed. You're right. Isn't that I don't know. Google Rewards finally started work. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good too. <laughs> yeah, I feel like that's specific to you though. Um, yeah, because yeah, I think it was working for the rest of us. It also helped that I got rid of it and reinstalled it. Oh yeah, again. Mm-hmm. Interesting, interesting that that wasn't working. Other than that, I mean, I can't think of anything off the top of my head that I noticed from just a basic consumer view. Yeah, I'm, I'm not someone who necessarily dives into the tech stuff as my right. friends do. So, well, hopefully, we can surface some pretty awesome things yeah. for people here. Um, yeah, I think you hit most of the like visual changes that people are going to notice when they're just using their phone day to day. The notification bar is is the biggest thing that's changed. Am I allowed to look at? Yes, you can open up the show notes now. You, okay. Yeah, yeah. Th- this is like uh, the the cards have been spoiled. You can now look at the whole set. Okay. So yeah, one thing. Let's let's stay on the notifications as a topic for a little bit here because there there's a bit that's going on there. Uh, that they've changed. I let's talk about the 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 visual change first. Um, I had some difficulty with it at first, actually, because uh, like to my eyes, I was having a really hard time differentiating like where one notification started and the next one really, you know, ended. Yeah, because like I was used to having that gap in between them mm. when they were when they used the card motif. Okay. Um, but when you just had that tiny little like one pixel high dark line in between each notification, I don't know, they just they kind of blended together for me. And I was just like, there's this giant block of white stuff on my screen. I don't know what to do with this. Um, I didn't have that, but maybe that, I'm a different person. So yeah, I, yeah. My brain process. Only- Mileage will vary. Yeah. Um, another thing that they allow now is uh most most notifications will be expandable um so if you've got like for example um if gmail has has sent you a bunch of notifications uh those will all kind of be grouped into one notification slot initially but then you can expand that notification down to see each of the individual messages and then you can further expand each of those to see like the whole like most of the email content itself 
and then that will reveal the like actions that you can do on that email from the notification. Really? Yeah, it's it's a super slick system. Um, whereas before, like if if you had multiple, like if you had one Gmail notification, yeah, you could expand it down and see like the the whole message and what actions you can do, which is usually I think like reply or archive kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but then once you got a second email, then they'd be grouped into one notification and you just have to open that notification to, to see the, like to get into the app and do stuff with them. And that's like, man, this is a really, really powerful change, uh, especially when you couple it with the fact that now Android has a proper like system wide quick reply thing available for for app developers yeah. um so you don't even have to open up the app in order to respond to a message for a lot of like messaging apps and email apps and st stuff like that i have noticed that i can do that yeah i didn't know if that was something that i couldn't do before and then just rediscovered or <laughs> um yeah you could do it in like some specific apps before like hangouts allowed it yeah, um, that's where I... Yeah, but that was because, like, Google put in the effort, the, the developers who were doing Hangouts built that in. Okay. Um, and, I, and I think, I don't think that and many other people had it before because I think they were using some secret API that, you know, Google had, that, you know, they had access to because they worked at Google. Um, yeah, so the, the functionality behind notifications has increased dramatically, uh, and I'm really, really happy with them. Um, once I got over the, the visual change. Another thing that, I, that I'm that i a little bit kind of eh on is, uh, you know, so I, I'm used to, like, expanding notifications by kind of long pressing on them and then dragging down, mm. right? Um, that's, that's not a very clearly advertised thing, like, visually. So, like, it's, it's not very obvious what, when you have one that you can drag down and when you have one that you can't i didn't even know i could so, do that yeah yeah and and this is like something that's kind of a problem in most of android is sometimes like there'll be something that you can long press and then another thing will pop up but there's no way to know that you can do that until you try it okay so most users won't ever try that because we're just not trained to do that um you know unless you go and read the docs and everything right um so to give kind of a visual indication that you can expand things, they now have these little kind of chevrons that point downwards when you can expand it, and then they point upwards when you can tap on that chevron to collapse it again, right? And my problem is that a lot of times, if I'm just trying to tap on the notification to open it, I will accidentally hit in that upper area of the notification and either expand it or um, contract it. So like those little chevrons right next to the yeah. how long they've been around? Mm-hmm. Okay, so if I... Yeah, so it lo looks like that one can't really yeah. do much. Yeah, but the YouTube one that you've got there, that that can be expanded. So you can use the chevron to tap on it and make it get bigger, get smaller. Kind of. Um, yeah, so that's those are the notifications. Yeah. Um, any other thoughts on those? They're, they're there. They're not that interesting. Oh, I have no problem with them. That's unfortunate because this is probably the most interesting. Well, so, <laughs> some of the most interesting changes that we'll be talking about today. Yeah, it's, it's all pretty lukewarm. I mean, I thought it made it much more visible and much easier to see the notifications, individual notifications. And I know you said that you had trouble telling each one apart, but because it wasn't the big white block letters and the notifications themselves were bigger, mm -hmm. it made the text seem like it could fill out that a lot more as well as it, it actually highlighted the text as opposed to having it on the what you had before yeah and they they also did a few other tweaks to like help with how much information you can have on there so like those icons for which app it's from or for which person it's from yeah. have been moved from the right side from the left side to the right side so that you know they don't bump the text way over they, yeah. they sit over there where you usually don't have a whole lot of text because english is written from left to right so let me ask. So do you guys leave a lot of like little notifications in your tray a lot? Usually I address them as soon as I can. Uh, but sometimes I'll leave one in there if I need like a reminder to do something. So you, you aren't yeah. the kind of people to like have your, you know, status bar up on the top just full it's of icons. Full of icons? No. no. So I know a lot of people who do that because they just don't care or they just don't. That's pretty much right. They yeah. just don't care. <laughs> And this change, I think, is really cool for that kind of stuff because, you know, as you said, things get condensed down and things are still accessible, but they're mm -hmm. smaller and easier to find. But they're never going to notice and this will make them fix their notification issues. No. Um, and that's fine. They don't have to. It's just um, just a lifestyle. Yeah, I suppose we, we probably should respect people's lifestyle choice. A little bit. No, conform. Okay. Um, all right. 
This next item is kind of related to the notifications because it happens when you pull down the notifications. Now, this is the one I like. Yeah, this is a really good one. Um, so we've we've had like quick settings up above the notifications for quite a while, but you uh, you've had to pull down the notifications and then pull down that entire quick settings drawer to get to this stuff. So we're, we're talking like uh, the Wi-Fi settings, the Bluetooth settings, yeah. turning the flashlight on and off, you know, those kinds of things. And uh, thanks for that flashlight, Ryan. Anytime. And uh, they, Google kind of finally got wise and realized that, hey, everybody else who skins Android has had like kind of a row of re- like really, really quick settings up above the notifications that you can just toggle things on and off. So now they have that same thing. Um, the, the first like five settings that you have in your quick settings drawer yeah. become little icons that, that pop up. Wi-Fi signal, battery, do not disturb, and flashlight. Now, here's the thing. It's different for different people because you can change what you have up in the uh, quick settings. So if you pull it all the way down, uh, there's a little edit button. Um, the gear, right? Nope, nope. No, that, no that, was the, that goes to the Android Straight settings. settings. Okay. Yeah, so edit in the bottom right corner. That. Yeah, so that lets you drag around your uh, your quick settings, and uh, you can remove them some entirely if you never use them. You can add more from a list. Um, it's really, really powerful, especially since they have multiple pages that you can fill up on... What is that? I don't know. What did you just... Where'd you I go? I clicked on something called nearby. I don't know how this thing works. Yeah. So I, I think the, the this this new, what do you call this thing? This notification shade, tray, uh, pane. Yeah, I, ca- I mean, I call it the, ooh, wait a minute. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not sure either. I think Quick I called settings it, tray? Okay, but it used to be part of the notification. I don't know. So I love this thing. You know, the new little animation is really cool and really fun. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really cool that you can edit stuff. Now, is it, I don't know, so I'm asking, so... Can can applications put their own little quick yes. widget? Mm-hmm. That's wonderful. Mm-hmm. Android's needed that. I'm so happy. And there, yeah, I saw a an app on the Play Store that would like let you add custom you know buttons to the quick settings area, and everything from like a shortcut to an app to like changing different settings and stuff. And uh, I tried it out. Unfortunately, it was a little bit weird. Like sometimes the buttons seem to get uh, they would lose their functionality, and so when I tapped on them, it would like take me to the page for editing the what was on the quick settings. It was you know unreliable, um, but hopefully somebody can come up with a better implementation. I think this is a you know a perfect thing for newer Androids, newer versions of Android to to do. Mm-hmm. You know, make these common things, these places with utility more prominent and easier to use and add utility for developers yeah it's, it's kind of it reminds me a lot of the the task tray on the task bar on windows like it's mm. the thing that's always there always present everybody interacts with it and you know the task tray where the little icons go the things that represent running mm-hmm. processes is a perfect place for it do we need one of those on a phone though for running processes well, so for example, I have this battery monitor called GSAM Battery Monitor. Oh, and it, it has, has to have a persistent a, notification. It has a persistent notification. But, you know, we could just graduate that into one of these little icon deals any day now. You know, maybe not this version of Android, but maybe the next one. Okay. But, you know, it's something like that. It's it's that kind of level of importance. Mm-hmm. I can dig that. Yeah. One other thing about that, um, or at least like the, the quick settings, or even just the, the, the pull down from the start menu, something that you can see happening right now. Okay, it stopped doing it, but sometimes when I'm pulling down... I think that's because you're on the lock screen. Uh, well, it works sometimes, and it doesn't work the other times, and sometimes I'll have to pull it down all the way, and then it still goes back up. Oh, yeah. I Yeah, some of the gestures you have to get used to, and I haven't even gotten used to them completely yet. Um, but yeah. Uh, the other thing that I really like about this is that it having that row of five icons that are you know quick actionable... Yep. Uh, nicely separates the cases of like, if I tap on it, will it toggle the thing or will it open up a sub menu? For example, with the Wi-Fi setting before, if you tapped on it in the quick settings, it would toggle Wi-Fi on or off. And if you long pressed on it, it would bring you to the menu to choose what Wi-Fi network you were you were um, connected to, right? Of course, there was no visual indication that you could long press on it yeah. to get to that menu. So now, if you are in that just row of five settings, 
above the notification bar and you tap on it, that's the toggle. If you're in the full quick settings menu and you tap on it, that brings you to a menu to choose which Wi-Fi network you're connected. So it's, you know, it's, it's more consistent. You can, you can say with a greater degree of assurance what it's going to do if you touch it. Right. Makes sense. Yeah. And then of course you can still long press it to get to the actual screen if it has one. Oh yeah. Yeah. In the settings. Yeah. 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 Uh, all right, recents list. They changed a few things around here. Actually, this is a this is a pretty important one. So we now have Alt Tab. Yeah, it's wonderful. Uh, so before, if you tapped on the recents button, which is the square over on the right side on, on the bottom of your screen, uh, it would bring up this like infinite list of all of the apps that you've had open on your phone for a very very long time, and yeah. the one that you just had open is the one that's going to take up the most space because it's it's it you know it's there it's the one that's first in the list right yeah um so they changed they changed the visual style so that the one that you came from the app that you came from gets pulled all the way down and it's just a little bar at the bottom mm-hmm. so then the the biggest one is the one that you used before that app because most of the times when you go to the recent page what you're going to do is switch back to the app that you were using last they further made that easy by adding, by making it so that if you double tap the recents list, it switches you to the other app. I I noticed that too. Good. So, I didn't know if that was a new so, thing or not. So it I, is. I, I have an action. interesting thing to say about that. So um, I've had this feature for a little while, but on my OnePlus Three, where oh, yeah? it's implemented differently. So the um the the difference on the OnePlus Three is that instead of being in the recents button, that functionality is actually in the back button. So if you long press, what? If you just hold the back button, it'll just switch. That is bonkers. No, I think it's wonderful because it's much more natural to me to just... Why would it go in the back button? Because I'm going back to the previous app. Oh, I suppose. Okay. I, okay. I, I like that. It's okay. Of course, you know, the OnePlus 3 is all about customizability, but this is a great feature for Android. And of course, this feature also goes together with the other enhancement in the recent section, which the next thing to talk about, which is multi-window. Yes. Mm-hmm. So let's have at it. Multi-window support. You can have two windows. I think all you have to do is long press on the recents button and yep. it picks yep. the two most stacked apps. Uh, well, it takes the the current one that's open and makes that into the top one. Yeah. And then you get to choose what oh, the right. bottom one is. It just looks so big on my screen here that I couldn't tell. Oh, my. <laughs> uh, and so that's, yeah. Man, this has I been a see. long time coming. Wow. It should have been there in the last version of Android because why else would we have the uh, Pixel? Right. So the Pixel C, rather. Yeah, that's and, what I meant. And so what's funny, though, is so we have this now. And what devices is this available on? So it's sort of available on the 6P and the 6 and the 5X. Screens that, you know, sure, they can use it. But will you ever really use this on a phone? Probably not as much on a, on a tablet. Right. What tablets have this available? Sort of pretty much just that Nexus 9 that nobody liked. And that's pretty much it. Right. And the Pixel C, um, which costs too much for anybody to buy. Yeah. I, I'm hopeful that the uh shield tablet will be getting it soon because i did just get an update on the shield tablet that included the july of 2016 Mm. uh security updates from google so they're only a couple months behind yep and yeah when we were writing up the show notes for uh this and the second opinion that we're going to be doing of ios 10 i was like well i'm using my nvidia shield tablet right now it would be great to have like the Ars Technica review scrolling on one side and then our show notes on the other side so that I can like add in things that we missed. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's cool. Um, It's just unfortunately a little bit too late. Um, So unlike what Apple did when they introduced this functionality on the iPads, they did not bring it over to the iPhone. Mm. You can't do this on the iPhone. There is nothing. Even the plus? None of them. Okay. So it's only available on the iPads and the part where you can use both apps simultaneously is only available on the better iPads. You right. can have side by side on the lesser ones, but not interacting. Such as the ones that SPPS has. Exactly. And so, sure, it's on phones on Android. Like, after I saw it and I could use it, I still never used it. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, it's not like it's a bad thing for us to have it available, even if we're not going to use it, because somebody's going to be out there and they're going to love sure, the heck out sure. of it. But again, it's it's uh, like, can Android sell itself with this feature? Not really. Probably not. Not until tablets heavily use it. And apps Which heavily will support basically it. Basically, be never. But yeah, so the let's talk about that app support a little bit. Sure. Um, so most the the only apps that I can think of that can legitimately wouldn't want this to be a thing would be like games. I was thinking YouTube. 
Uh, I suppose, but well, but YouTube could take advantage of picture in picture, which is another new thing in Android Seven. Well, I guess we'll get there. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. So for, for most other apps, the the work that the developers have to do isn't really like the getting things to resize properly, because you know Android developers have had to hmm. accommodate for different sized, uh, different sized screens for a very long time right um it's it's more about how the app reacts to n- not being the first thing that's in the stack the that's foreground yeah you know, that's the yeah the foreground mm-hmm. but the second thing in the right, foreground right. which hasn't really been a state in previous versions of android so nobody really had to d- worry yeah. about it i i think you know some apps are sort of immune to it like a, a twitter app wouldn't care ever right well but then you're but then like the timeline that you're seeing over there isn't being visually updated maybe Maybe it is. Yeah, exactly. But, I mean, like, that's the thing, though. Like, nobody's going to complain about a Twitter app having slow updates. They'll just click it and force refresh. Right. It's fine for that. And, you know, apparently YouTube works, so that's amazing. Mm. Um, You know, I think this is cool, again, but... Yeah, it works until you bring up the uh, keyboard to type something into one of your windows. That <laughs> might be the issue. Because I was about to say, the biggest hey, thing that cool. I could see myself using this for is just transferring data. So, like, if I don't necessarily want to use messenger to send a contact card to someone for some reason or other Mm -hmm. um or like i as i think i mentioned before i've been listed the current a lot and they have a bunch of really cool musicians and bands that i've never heard of before and so Mm -hmm. i have sort of an ongoing list of hey i need to check these guys out when i get home and it'd be really nice to have just the currently playing open on the current up and then have like google keep open which is where i've been keeping that list hold up when you say listening to the current is there a current app no, just on um, Chrome. Okay. Oh, okay. Or, okay, I, I go on to Chrome to look up the now playing Are you stuff. sure there's a current app? Actually, there might be. Okay. Okay, but so you have it streaming somewhere in some other app, and then you need to open up your notes to add stuff into the list? Yeah, okay. and it's it's not even... I don't have it streaming there because it's just... We have a radio at the warehouse. Okay, sure. Um, But yeah, so like the website open so that I can look at what I need to find and then mm-hmm. having keep open so that I can actually write it down and not having to switch back and forth like, okay, what about now? Or do I remember this right? And Couldn't you just copy and paste it? I suppose I could. <laughs> just to be the snarky one over here in the corner. <laughs> you puppy. So I, I still feel like this is just a couple of years too late. Like my time of need has passed. My Nexus 7 is gone. Oh, you're all grown up now? You don't need, uh, you don't don't, need to have I, multiple windows? No, I don't. He's a big boy now. <laughs> Mm-hmm. it's sad but it's um speaking of multi-window kind of going along with that is picture in picture um so this is a feature that i think is specific to android tv i can't i'm not entirely sure um but this is where like a video player such as youtube could if if the developer of the app enables it so not youtube yeah i know i was so surprised when i was trying to find this in youtube you can't do it well why would youtube want that they want you to pay for you what no, so okay, so this feature is like while you're playing a YouTube video, you can go into picture in picture mode so that you can have the YouTube play like still playing up in a corner of the screen, but then you can go through like the Android TV menu and go and do other things while right. still playing. Right, and so normal people don't get the experience of having YouTube be defocused. What? Right, so like on a norm for a normal you pay for YouTube, right? Right. So normal people don't. And so mm-hmm. if they did enable this feature for YouTube uh-huh. and you put it in picture in picture, but then left the YouTube app, uh huh, they wouldn't want that. Why not? Because then you you wouldn't pay for YouTube Red anymore. What does that have to do with YouTube Red? Because that's the point of YouTube Red, being able to leave YouTube. No. Yeah. No, the point is to not see ads. And to and have that functionality. St- you can still show them ads. Well, because like, it's not like the YouTube video is gone. It's still there on the screen. You can still see it. Sure. So they can still s- display ads to you. They don't want you to leave the app. I'm so confused. That's okay. Like, this is entirely different than leaving YouTube entirely and having the audio still playing in the background. Uh, it's similar to that. Similar, right. But, like, have they... So this is the same reason that it doesn't work on, on the iOS version of Picture in Picture. YouTube forbids it. Really? Yeah. Oh. Huh. It's good stuff. Even with um the red stuff. Mm. That's so weird. Yeah, That's I know. so weird. Thank okay. you, Google Ad. Uh, moving on, we now have finally a proper built-in file explorer. That's pretty cool. We've had like 
they've been kind of feeding it to us in bits and pieces over the last couple of versions of Android. But now you can actually go to like any, pretty much any file that's on. The, I I, the phone. I did test this for sort of a weird fringe case. Okay. Uh-huh. Ha-ha. Um, <laughs> so uh, I I attempted to, with my my phone is a USB Type C phone uh-huh. 6P here. And I attempted to take my USB Type-C, USB Type-A connector mm-hmm. and plug in a flash drive, see if it would mount. Okay. It did mount, but I couldn't copy or paste files to it because of Android file system protection or something. Weird. So sure, I can file explore to it, but it can't do anything to it other than to see the file names. Okay. So I guess it's cool, um, but uh, normal people will never see this and never need it. Right, but uh, hopefully this this reduces the number of people who get tricked into installing ES for File Explorer. Just so. buy Solid Explorer; it's the good one. Yeah, or or don't buy anything since you don't need to anymore. Well, right? I, mean, I mean, you do if you want to do anything useful. Can't you still do stuff with the? Can Solid Explorer like mount a USB thumbstick and then do stuff with it? You need root for that anyway. Okay. So so no, a- Android just sucks. So okay. that's it. Um. Let's see, customizing display size. So this is going to apply to Ryan and his giant, giant phones. Oh, I thought you were going to say that I'm blind. No, <laughs> I did. I sent my dad uh, this section of the Ars Technica review because I was like, Dad, you can make text way bigger on your phone yeah. now because you don't, you, you need glasses. <laughs> and, um, but uh, no, for you, Ryan, you can make text smaller. So it's already the, small enough. The, well, the problem, so the problem with like Android on large phone sizes is that most of the time the scaling is exactly the same as on a smaller phone screen size, right? So the amount of information that you've got on your screen is the same as the amount of information I've got on my screen. It's just that everything looks bigger on your screen. So the the idea is that like people who have a large phone screen and who are probably also power users who want to increase the density of, of information on the display, uh, they can change the scale of everything so that uh, they have more information on their screen at once. Great. Woo. Uh, we, of course, have some emoji changes, which is uh, a thing that a lot of people care about, and, I, and I'm and i not sure if the three of us do at all. I don't use these except um, for like maybe the occasional well, one. My grandmother can only type in fraction and emoji, so <laughs> I think this is a big and imp- very important change for all of us. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Um, so kind of a summary of the changes is that uh, the the emojis are a little bit more consistent now with each other. Um, before it was like some of them were kind of facing away, like sideways to the camera. Some of them were facing directly towards the camera. Now they're all facing directly towards the camera. Um, some of the the like gender neutral emojis that Google had that honestly got a lot of flack and i and i don't agree with the fact that they were getting a lot of flack um because everybody was like they look like little thumbs they look like blobs eh, they're so ugly but i'm like well that means that they're not identifiable as like a certain type of person yeah. which is great i like that too because that that's inclusiveness um so yeah some some of them uh are gendered now um which is unfortunate so you yeah, some of them are like falling into stereotypical like uh, job e- expectations, right? You know, um, and oh, we actually have support for skin tones now, which is good. It is good. Yeah, because I was tired of seeing all of those uh, emoji followed by just a s- rectangle of color that is supposed to be what color it's, it is. Oh wait, I still have to see that on Windows. Hmm, you're never gonna get that fixed on Windows. Wait, so what? Yeah. Don't worry. Uh, so, so in whatever version of, uh, of the UTF, um, is that the right acronym? It's UTF-8, yeah. Yeah. Um, they, they started supporting, uh, having different skin colors for emojis, right? Yeah. Uh, and so, like, iOS, I think, was the first major platform that put that update into their emoji set. Uh, and so, like, iOS users could long press on, you know, the, the thumb, like, middle finger and and send you uh, a middle finger that was dark brown instead of like yellow right mm. um and everybody else who didn't have that update yet they would see a yellow middle finger followed by a rectangle that's uh, dark brown because instead of instead of creating a whole new set of characters uh the way that it encodes it is the character for the emoji followed by a character that is just the color and on systems that support changing the skin tone, right? 
we'll just merge those into one character that gets displayed to the you. Everybody else sees it as two characters. Now, what's really cool, in JavaScript, you can actually split that character that looks like one character into the three parts. Three parts? Yeah. Oh, right, because there's a blank. Yeah, if, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's really cool. Um, I also wanted to mention that Unicode 9, which is the Unicode that we're talking about here, mm-hmm. Um, adds exactly seven hundred or seven thousand five hundred new characters for a total of one hundred twenty eight thousand one hundred seventy two characters. These additions include six new scripts and seventy two emoji. Woo! And that's it. Um, now we've got a few kind of technical changes to the operating system. Um, most of these, unfortunately, are changes that even current phones that were on Android six and now are on Android seven, we don't get those advantages it'll only be phones that start with android 7 will get these advantages um so for example updates um they they're going to have two different system partitions which is really sweet uh because that now updates will work the way that they've worked on chrome os for a really really long time where um your phone will download the update and then it will alter the system image that is not being used so that that one gets updated. And then next time you restart the phone, instead of the phone having to shut down and then start installing the update, it can just shut down, switch to the image that has already been updated and then start up again. And then once it's started up later on, probably when it's idle and like charging or whatever, it'll update the system image that is old, but has, you know, was being used at the time. Right. So that restart, uh, for the update is going to be really, really fast. Yep. And the downside of this new plan is that... It's going to take up more sta- space on your device? Yes, that is a major downside, and that's probably one of the considerations for the fact that it is not available on any currently mm. using Nexus device mm-hmm. at all, anywhere. So not even the V20, which is allegedly going to be the first phone with Android 7.1, the version of Android, that, or 7, that this came out with, 7.1 is the first version of Android that's shipping with a phone, actually. Mm-hmm. That's supposed to be the first one, but not even that phone will have that feature enabled. Is the V20 one of the Pixel ones? No, the V20 is just an LG Oh, phone. wait, is that the LG? Oh, right. Sorry, I was thinking that V20 was like a code name, no, but no, that's no. the actual. And, yeah, right. Leave it to marketing. <laughs> and and so th- this, this kind of a technological feat of having two images sounds really easy, really obvious. Windows doesn't even do it. I mean... Mm-hmm. I mean, OS X sort of does it, but it, I mean, these are little well, things. Windows system partitions are rather large. Sure, but I mean, it could it could store a copy of the OS somewhere, right? Pro- probably, yeah. I mean, you know, computer hard drives are huge compared to phone drives. Mm. Um, and so I think one of the reasons they um, didn't do this for so long on phones is that, you know, it, it's going to take up five gigabytes storage space on two partitions. That's half of a 32 gigabyte phone. That seems like a, a bit of an exaggeration there, five gigabytes. I don't know. I mean, it's uncompressed. I mean, it it has applications installed already. I mean, I don't think it's a stretch. Mm. Speaking of applications, uh, we won't have to see the optimizing app blank of blank anymore. Thank you. Yeah, gosh, Thank you. that was the I think one of the biggest kind of hurt points of updating an Android device was waiting for all of those to compile again. Yep. Um, and so the the technical reason why this isn't a thing anymore is because uh, instead of the all of the code for all of the apps being compiled ahead of time, and then once you start up the app, it's just it's already compiled and everything. Um, what they're doing now is they are combining ahead of time compi- com- compilation compiling sure. uh, with just in time compiling. Um, so in some cases when your phone opens up an app that you haven't like opened before, it has to compile the code uh, that you're going to need. Um, so it, it's possible that like opening up a new app is going to be a little bit slower, um, but I think they're going to kind of intelligently compile ahead of time the stuff that you're going to need, and then once you open the app, it'll compile the stuff that you don't need right away, but you might need later on while you're using the app. Yeah, my understanding of how it works is that when you do your phone update, the reason it has to recompile all of that stuff is because system level stuff in Android, not like not like all the APIs, but like private APIs might have changed and they need to be recompiled because mm-hmm. those are the things that interface with the like C layer and you know we're on the Java layer, right? Mm-hmm. And those bindings need to be recompiled. That's what that optimizing X of X is. Mm-hmm. And you don't need to necessarily do that if you just jit them as soon as you need them and then um i think what they said at io is that 
during downtime, so like while the phone is charging and idle, it will um, look to see hot paths and applications from the JIT compiler and then take those optimi optimizations and apply them to the a AOT compiler. Okay. And then, then everybody will... Just, it's a great combination of... Yeah, very smart. Uh, speaking of only doing that kind of thing when it's plugged in and resting uh, is battery life, uh, which is something that Android has struggled a lot with in the past, but in the last couple of versions of Android, they've made a lot of actually significant gains. Are you telling me that I get double the battery life? Uh, no, I don't think... I think that's a little bit extreme. Too bad. Um, but for example, like in the last version of Android, uh, they introduced Doze, which was a feature where like if your uh, device spends most of its time just sitting and not moving, um, it would determine that, hey, nobody's around, nobody's using me, uh, so I'm going to go into like a super low power mode where it, it restricts what apps are able to do and everything. Um, and that was like a perfect thing for my Shield tablet, which spends most of its time on my bedside table because I'm at work. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then like when I come home and I haven't touched it for a couple of days, I want to I want to grab it and have it be at like 80 percent battery yep. life instead of like five. Yep. And then I realize that I have to plug it in before I can use it again. Um, now, that didn't help my phone very much. Right. Because my phone was in my pocket the whole time. And so it's moving around. And so those never got activated. Right. So what they've done this version of Android is they've introduced something called mobile Doze, where even if the device is moving around a lot, if you haven't turned on the screen for a while, it'll go into kind of a, you know, a lower power mode than normal, but not quite as low power as proper dose, right? So it'll restrict certain kinds of background stuff, um, and uh, but, it, but it won't restrict them nearly as much as dose dose. Um, so it doesn't restrict dose? No. <laughs> huh. um, my, one of my concerns with this is, is it going to restrict things that I wanted to actually be doing in the background? Um, for example, like my phone has served as my pedometer for a really long time um, because it's just always there. It's always in my pocket. Um, so if, if like Google Fit was one of the things that got restricted and couldn't check with the pedometer, with the accelerometer, right, to figure out how many steps I've taken, well, that's going to break my pedometer. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I kind of kept my eyes open for, for things that change uh, in this update. Um, and I think I have noticed some delayed notification. So like if I haven't used my phone in a while um, and then I turn on the screen, suddenly I'll get like a few notifications from Phoenix. Uh, and it's like, well, those tweets actually happened a while ago. Why didn't I get those notifications at the time? So I think one of the things that they must be restricting is the... Um, you know, the push notification system um, that goes through uh, Google's... What, what do they call those servers? Whatever the notification is. Anyway. Uh, push. Sure. Um, I also noticed that uh, this is kind of a, this is kind of a, a fringe case, um, but uh, when I'm playing Zombies Run, right, um, I've got, like, a podcast player or a music player going in the background, and then Zombies Run will pause that whenever it needs to play some audio for the story to keep going in Zombies Run. Mm -hmm. um, and usually, I think bef before this version of Android, uh, it wouldn't have any trouble starting back up the podcast. Um, I noticed on my last run that sometimes Pocket Casts wouldn't start playing again after, it, uh, after the, the audio from Zombies Run finished. So what I think was happening is Pocket Casts, because it was paused... Uh, and just and waiting to be played again. I think it got killed in the meantime. I think the process just you know Android decided, hey, you're not important. You're not doing anything right now, so we're gonna shut you down. Yep. Um. So I don't know uh enough about the technical level of Mobile Doze, which is a weird name for it, but fine. Yeah. Could be called like Zombies Doze or something. <laughs> um. But it would be interesting if there were any uh, API flags that a developer could set in an application to say. Well, you know, this app is Doze compatible. Well, you know, this app isn't Mobile Doze compatible. Well, you know, this app can Doze at this frequency and not more, mm -hmm. right? Um, one of the things with their um, timer conglomeration, th there was some kind of timer coalescing. They, oh, yeah, yeah. They had a few Android releases ago. One of the problems with that release was that 
they didn't force that upon every developer at once mm -hmm. because le legacy apps still had to work just the same way. And so you can imagine uh, Facebook, for example, still does not actually utilize that API necessarily because they have to support old versions of Android all over the place. So that's probably one of those things where, um, you know, I don't know the logic behind mobile dose or regular dose, but if it's like, well, if you're not using the new AP API, then you just get kicked out. Or if you are using the new API, then you're okay under these conditions. Something like that needs to get worked out in the, in the app ecosystem first. Mm -hmm. um, on the security front, they have introduced a new version of encryption. Um, so up until now, if you have your device encrypted, uh, whenever you turn it on, you're going, like, I mean, from a cold boot, right? Yep. Um, you're going to have to put in your pattern or, you know, pin or you know, unlock your device before it can even start Android, um, which is kind of a problem. Uh, I thought it was really funny when I read the, the Ars Technica review and they were talking about like, you, you know, like if your phone crashes in the middle of the night and then it tries to restart yeah. itself mm -hmm. and it's just sitting on this screen waiting for you to put yep. in your uh, password, that screen, because it happens before Android starts up, it doesn't have any like power saving features. So it'll just stay on that screen. It'll stay on forever and ever until it runs out of battery power. And I'll never wake you up. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, right. Cause your alarm doesn't go off. Yeah. And, uh, and I l read that and kind of laughed cause I'm like, my I've never had that happen with my phone. My phone hasn't crashed in the middle of the night. I have mean, a Nexus device. Literally like a week afterwards, it happened to me. Good. I woke up the next morning and it was waiting for me to put in my password. I'm like, what? Oh, so, wow. so clearly the lesson is you should have had two phones, one backup phone. Um, well, that actually I happened mean, to clearly my, mom. my watch is the thing that wakes oh, me up well, in the morning I, anyway. You don't even have a Wear watch. No. Got to go. Got a pebble. Let's go. It's ecosystem. So great. Uh, my mom actually had this actual happen to her. She has a Zen phone too, which is not known to be the most stable thing ever. Okay. And she was using her phone as her alarm one time and it, it crashes all the time and oh, uh, there it goes. Um, but yeah, so so what they've done to kind of alleviate this problem is uh, file-based encryption. So each individual file on the system can be encrypted um, and possibly encrypted using a different system. So what they're doing is the personal files, right, the stuff that's actually associated with apps that you have installed and stored and information that's stored about you on the phone, um, that is going to be encrypted with your passcode. Now, the system files that Android uses to start up and everything, those are going to be encrypted using a weaker encryption that's based on like the hardware certificate or whatever of, of something on the phone. So it can actually start up Android and get you all the way to the lock screen before you have to enter in your passcode. Mm -hmm. um, now, once you turn it on and you get to the lock screen, if you don't enter in your passcode for a couple of hours, you're probably not going to be getting too many notifications because those apps haven't had a chance to start up until you put in your passcode. Um, now, this is, a, this is another one of those features that is not going to be available on current phones that got updated to Win, or Windows 7. Wow. Uh -huh. uh, Android 7 um, for obvious reasons, right? You'd have to go and like decrypt everything on the phone and then re-encrypt it using right. this new system. And yeah, like... That's that's a whole lot of business. Uh, probably rather risky because um, you could, yeah, you you, you could corrupt a lot of stuff right. going through that system. Um, I think you I, I think you can actually force it if you want to, but it's labeled as like an experimental future yeah. kind of thing. I wouldn't do it. No, me neither. I'm happy. I I had a bad experience encrypting uh, a device that wasn't ready for it <clears throat> shield tablet um and it took me a really really long time to figure out that that was what was slowing down my tablet so much mm. and so the next time that i wiped everything from the tablet and reinstalled i decided not to encrypt um finally we have daydream uh, which is but we don't have it yet yeah so that's the vr interface for uh for the phone um where for example like notifications that come in instead of like peeking in and being normal they you know it gets split into the two different uh views for your eyes so you can actually see it and not hurt yourself hmm. going cross-eyed <laughs> trying to read this thing um and and so yeah di like different notifications depending on what their priority level is um will either show up in your vr world or not show up um and it, when they do show up they're actually like an object that is in the world so it's a certain distance away from you and it gets displayed properly um you know they'll also have like kind of a landing page for vr so when you first like stick your phone into a cardboard um and it'll it'll you know have you in this menu being like okay which app do you want to launch do you want to go to the store and take a look at some 
uh, VR ready apps. You know. Speaking of which, I need to go and play with cardboard. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I got a couple of cardboards uh, at home, and we were playing around with them, um, petting a fox and fl- following some birds. I think. Yeah. 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 We need more alpacas in VR. You do. I I think um I think we should also take this moment to talk about the future of Android seven point zero. Sure. Which is seven point one is coming henceforth. Right. What's and, coming up in there? Well, um, Daydream probably for real. Mm-hmm. Um, among among other things, one of the most notable features is the new default launcher, which may or may not be coming. One of this the one of these weird things with Android. The, the the alleged thing with Android is that Nexus phones stock experience and the version of Android on a Nexus phone is the stock experience. Right. Well, with 7.1, that might deviate a little bit from what we've normally associated with stock. They're going to have a special launcher called a Pixel Launcher. Okay, so that's not going to be specific to the Pixel phones? That's going to be available on Nexus phones as well? Well, there won't be Nexus phones anymore with the Pixel phone launch, so nobody really knows for sure. Right, but like, will my Nexus 5X yes, presum- get the Pixel launcher? Presumably it will. Originally, it was going to be called the Nexus launcher, but then they decided to change the name of the line and the name of the thing and decided to package it all up as one update. It's really weird. Um, so, you know how Android has been releasing major version numbers for years? Right. Like three years in a row, since five. Mm-hmm. And then prior to that, it was 4.4 for one year and mm-hmm. then prior to that it was jelly bean three point versions for multiple releases okay so jelly bean for a long time kit kat lollipop marshmallow and then i missed one. i i don't know i wasn't paying attention maybe i didn't no this <laughs> no this is this is nougat right i get yeah. it i didn't miss it really oh so oh yeah where do um where do you go to see the little uh, oh the, the name of it the, so the easter little, egg the easter egg right so you go oh into my this... gosh the easter egg in this thing is ridiculous i haven't even looked at it how did i not so it occur to me, so, so so to conclude that thought this might be the last um major su- like super big version number update for a while um one of the things they say they're switching to are sort of monthly or quarterly updates so it might just change you know minor version numbers it might just be bug fixes. Nobody really knows. Okay. But this could be the last one for a while. Where Where is that? Uh, what you're looking at? Okay. It's really boring. It just shows you an end. And if you long press on it, it pops up with like a little emoji of a cat. And then if you long press on it again, it's an emoji of a, of a no sign. And then a cat again. And then a no sign. I have no idea what that means. No cat? Cat no? No cat. Wait, Nugget. How, how, Nugget. Do I, how do I get to the cat? You long press on it. Like and then long. you and then you let go. Okay, I had actually seen this right. before. I thought it's supposed to be more to it. See that little cat down there? Oh, down at the bottom. I'm blind. What's wrong? Maybe Ryan has a faulty phone. I don't Probably. know. All right. Uh, so that's Android Seven Nougat. Is it good enough? Uh, it's okay. Yeah, it's fine. Um, now, um, we should also play the, our Verge card here. You'll probably never get this update if you have a current oh, phone. Good. Um, too bad for you, I guess. Right. Oh well. Uh, but I mean, everybody should be getting just, access to anyway. Mean, just, just buy an iPhone. <laughs> That's it. Um, though I mean, it's <sighs> oh, found the cat. <laughs> yeah, discussions of of Android's uh, update process aside, like it it is important to talk about new versions of Android because eventually everybody's going to have that version of Android. You know, so like people who buy new phones this year are going to be getting seven. Maybe. Right. Depends. Um. And then now, so let's say, this is the worst case scenario, we have, we're have we reviewing 7 today. In a matter of weeks, 7.1 is going to come out. Mm-hmm. So then how many OEMs who got a copy of 7 three weeks ago are going to still be putting that on their phones two months from now? Mm-hmm. What about phones that launch at CES and at Mobile World Congress next year? What version of Android will those target? Will those target 7.1 or 7.2, which launches in in March? There are some unanswered questions about the ecosystem, and that kind of rapid release schedule, while cool for us, Nexus and Pixel people, is awful for the OEM market for people who buy phones that are Nexus phones. Right. So normal people will never see the current version of Android. It's just the fate that everybody will have. Yeah. I just, yeah, I still think of it like... Ah, we shouldn't be reviewing this movie because most of the people who go into the movie theater aren't going to be watching this movie. They'll be watching other movies. And it's like, well, that's ridiculous. That's a, that's a completely different um, issue than is this a good movie or not, right? It's like reviewing the director's cut of the movie when everybody just saw the regular theatrics. Okay, yeah. But that, yeah, I think it's still worth like analyzing a thing to see if it's good or not. Sure, it's great. 
but you'll never have it. So this has been Second Opinion. Thanks for joining us, everybody. If you would like to drop us a line, give us feedback on this episode, go ahead and click that contact link underneath our faces on the show notes page. Once again, that is thenexus.tv slash SO8. If you want to suggest uh, another topic for us to review, uh, go ahead and let us know. If you want to review something for us, let us know. Alternatively, if you don't feel comfortable clicking on a contact link and typing a bunch of stuff in, you can find us elsewhere on the internet. I'm Ian R. Buck. You can find me on Twitter and uh, on ianrbuck.com. And of course, you can find me just whatever, but especially on the Twitter at Ryan Amar. And of course, on my website, ryanrampersett.com, we can find everything else. I'm, yeah, contact Buck. Working on getting better at checking the Twitter, though. I will make myself a, 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 an internet presence somewhat. <laughs> That's good. That's good. So, and that's at Bigfoot 11. Have a good one, everybody. Have a good one.